remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. Where you're coming from? A comet came down, crash landed in the hood, Joe. We ain't know what to 
call it. Really ain't know what to look for. A spirit came out. It's speaking English out of mouth. So soft, you had to cram to understand what she was saying. It spoke of a change of plans. Some kind state of mind that only follows the models you would find on the shrine. Quit trying to do it. Get out on the playing field. <laughs> ain't sick just because you say it's ill. Dig your hands in the dirt. Shake it off and do the work. I give in to give birth. I'm on a mission. Open the way, open the way. Listen to you, listen to you for the answer. that we call God by all the names of honor, glory, and power, by all traditions that God has honored. And we're asking for the blessing of our ancestors. We're asking for the blessing of the architects of our present. We're asking them to be present here today. We're calling them forward. We're calling their names forward. So their energy, their blessing, their wisdom, their knowledge, all the things they've given us, we can call on today. We're asking for the blessing of this space. We're using water to do that because we are composed of water, the world is composed of water, and water is a symbol of our unity. So at this time, I'm going to ask uh, my dear Baba, Randy, we're going to ask in particular for the blessing and to call out the names of your parents, to thank them for what they have brought forth. So Frank that, Weston, Vivian Moore. Yes. And Mama Fatu, the names of your parents. Alamo Faye. Uh, I should. Love will come back. I should. And Willard, you know, Willard Jenkins. All right. Mm -hmm. And Louise Jenkins. All right. So this time I'd like for everyone to call out the names of those in our ancestral heritage and our ancestral lineage that may be part of our history, may be part of our culture, may be part of your own family line. We want to honor and ask for the blessing of all of those, the higher spirits, those that are guiding us today, on whose shoulders we stand. Please. All right. John Horace For the names of all of those we call, for all of those whose names we can remember, for the elevated spirits, we ask you to continue to walk among us, to continue to guide us, so that the circle of our family, the circle of our community, the circle of our village is complete with the those of us who are present now, the unborn, those who have gone before, and those yet to come. 
And Randy, we thank you very much for your contribution to our lives. And I would just ask that we give another round of applause before we even get started, because we know before we get started with, before we read one word from the autobiography, that Baba Weston is a wonderful contributor to our lives and our culture. So, please, the biggest applause. Thank you. Thank you. And at Sankofa, can you hear me on this mic? At Sankofa, we take it as a privilege to be able to honor people like Randy Weston. Because we know that with the kind of work that he's done, we get inspired to do the kind of work that we do, and all of us do. So for us, this is a very, very special day, and we want to make sure that we honor him in a way that is very African for us. Uh, in the diaspora, we fight tooth and nail to find out who we are and to protect our culture, to be able to preserve our culture and explore it, critique it, and embrace the part that we think is positive for us and useful for our children. So that's what we're doing here today. We're embracing our brother and, of course, our other brother here, uh, Willard Jenkins, who's made this very possible, um, who has the expertise and the uh, insight, knowledge, and scholarship to make sure that we can get the information out that we need from our brother in the form of a book, uh, a wonderful collaboration. So uh, please give Brother Jenkins an applause also. Thank you. Tonight is going to be very interesting. Um, this was Willard's idea. Uh, to my understanding, it's going to be the format of an interview, and in that way, we will be able to provoke information from the book, your experiences, etc. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give the mic over to you. So thank you. Once. Thank you. And uh, a special thanks to Sankofa Books, and a very special thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, this really brings to mind the, the very first book event that we did was at an African-American bookstore in Los Angeles in Lamert Park called Esso One Books, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. So coming here today is, is like bringing us full circle on this whole excursion to talk about this book, African Rhythms. And hearing the drum invocation for this particular activity was, was very important because it, 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 it brought to mind uh, something about Randy, many, many elements of Randy, but specifically it made me think of the fact that if any of you have studied piano, you know that the classical technique of playing the piano is to play it with your fingers kind of like this roughly. But Randy Weston, when you see Randy Weston play the piano, you see Randy play the piano with his palms flat. And it's like playing a drum. It's as though Randy is, is, has at his facility 88 drums. Tell us how you came to play the piano that way and why that's important to your music making. I never thought about it. I mean, all the great pianists I knew played like that, you know. And I guess maybe it's our heritage because it's maybe what we call our ancestral memory. And we do things in a certain way that we're not sure why we did it, you see. And of course, the drum has always been quite symbolic. And I've worked with some of the truly greatest drummers in the world. I was a uh, Max Roach was uh, one of my teachers in Brooklyn. Uh, through Max, I met Charlie Parker, I met Dizzy, I met Miles, I met John Coltrane, George Russell, and whatnot. But I guess it's just a natural way to play the piano because when I play the piano, the piano becomes an orchestra. And by becoming an orchestra, for me, which I learned from Mr. Ellington, sound, and Mr. Monk, sound, so I guess when I play the piano, I'm really playing an African drum at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely, and that, that, of course, is a reflection on your upbringing. Uh, tell us about how you came to play the piano in the first place. Well, I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, an African-American community. 
In our section, we do a time of segregation. We didn't associate with white people because we couldn't be with white people. We had to be in our own community. But it was great. We had our own ballrooms, our own nightclubs, our own churches, our own organizations that did benefits for children, black church. So the community was incredible for music. And everybody in the community had a piano. I never understood why. Because economically, our ancestors were going through a lot of pain. You couldn't get work because you were black. You couldn't get this and that and the other. Everybody had a piano. And my father, my father came from Panama, by way of Jamaican heritage. He told me years later, in Panama, he heard this pianist play in a hotel. And he said that the piano was so beautiful. So maybe in his mind, he wanted his son to play the piano. So my father is the one that wanted me to take piano lessons. And how did he work that out? How did he arrange that? How did he arrange it? Yeah. He got a piano teacher. And, and talk about your experience with her. Her name was Mrs. Chapman. She was typical of the sisters of those days. And she's Elegant. in the book. <laughs> Class. Her picture. Wonderful women, you know. 50 cents a lesson. One hour a week, you made a mistake, bang, hit your hand with that ruler, do it again. And meanwhile, my father's watching too. Because our ancestors, they didn't play music, but they knew music, they could tell, you know. So this poor lady, because I was six foot and I was 12 years old, and those days I thought I was going to the circus. I had big feet, I was a little awkward, you know. But still, I wanted to play basketball and football and baseball. So all the kids out there in the street, hey, I am practicing these scales, you know. So finally, this poor lady, after three years, she went to my father and said, Mr. Wesson, save your money. Your son will never play the piano. That's a true story. But my father got another piano teacher and he knew a few popular songs, you know. So that's when I really started to study piano. So you think it was the fact that your original piano teacher kind of taught you from the, the European tradition that it didn't work out between you and Mrs. Chapman? Yeah, I couldn't identify. I grew up with the blues and the big bands and the, you know, all of our music had that rhythm, had that beat, had that spirit of Africa, you know. And so I couldn't identify. But I found out later it was important because it gave me the skills to be able to function on the instrument and get the message that I want to get and how I can move my fingers to do that. So she was vital. And I always say in my book, I have her on the second, third page of the book because I imagine what that poor lady had to go through. And I imagine if I go to the happy hunting ground, I'm gonna look for her <laughs> because she was my foundation of not only the piano, but black dignity. Uh, the, the women of that period, the way they dressed, the way they, they gave us so much love, so much patience to try to make something out of us, you know. So she represented that, that world. Yeah. All right, now the book is called African Rhythms. And uh, as we were working on the project, you made it clear early on that you wanted this book to be called African Rhythms. Tell us why not only is the book called African Rhythms, but you call your, your, your various ensembles African Rhythms. Tell us why. Well, that happened with a, a, a series of things. But number one, I was programmed by my father and mother. Everything I do comes from them. My father was a, a fellow of Marcus Garvey, but he was not a, a, an associate. He didn't believe in organization. He was an individual. But he loved Garvey's philosophy. And he loved it so much that he instilled upon me when I was six years old. He said, my son, he said, you are an African born in America. He said, America, you're only going to learn about Africa after colonialism and after slavery. He said, you have to learn about the great African empires to know who you are. So my dad in the house, he had many books by J.A. Rogers, by African historians, African-American historians, European Historians who wrote the truth about Africa. And my dad, on the, on the wall, he had maps and photographs of African kings and African queens. Now, when I went to the, to the street, it was a different world. Africans had no civilization. They did nothing. They were always servants of people like Tarzan. 
So I had this, this two worlds, you know, because when you go to school, your parents want you to get good marks, okay? But to get good marks, you gotta do what the teacher tells you to do. And some of these things are not correct. So I had some problems in school, especially with history. Mm -hmm. But my father gave me the foundation of Africa. He said, this is our ancestral home. He said, the only way I'm gonna be able to understand him and my mother better, I have to go back to Africa. So from that point on, my mother gave me the black church. I had to be there every Sunday with my bow tie and my little short pants and uh, squeeze in between the sisters, you know. You can't go to the toilet but so many times, you know. But I absorbed the, the African spirituality of the black church, you see. So that's, that's my foundation. And from that foundation, it's taken me all over the planet. I'm an African born in America. I love my people. My people are a beautiful people. So in my music, I try to project the beauty of African people and how much we've contributed to this planet Earth, you see. So that's basically it, will it? Yeah. Well, you know, I was talking to a journalist earlier and uh, talked about the fact that there are many musicians who have endeavored to address Africa in some way, shape, or form in their music. But for many, either it's some effort at trying to arrive at a fusion, or it's, 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 it's some element of almost being a tourist. But for you, it's been an immersion. Uh, Africa has in, informed your composition and your life and so much of your spirit. But talk about, as a composer, how Africa has informed your, your composition. Well, you know, again, going back to Dad, he said, always be around the best minds that you can find, no matter what the field is, mathematics, science, whatever, number one. And number two is that uh, <coughs> there was no information about us as a people. My dad would say, we're the only people that can't send a package home. You see? Because we were cut off from the continent. We cut off from our language. Cut off from the way we dress, the way we eat our food. But again, having a Virginia mother, having a Caribbean father, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I saw the similarities in my parents. I saw the similarities in African people where it was always an emphasis on how different we are, you know. West Indians don't like Southern blacks, Southern blacks don't like West Indians, all this kind of nonsense. But growing up in this family with a wonderful mother and father, they gave me an approach to life that we are an African people and we never left Africa spiritually, no matter how long we've been on the planet Earth. So that's my resources going back as far as I can. When I go to Africa, I look for the oldest musician I can find. I look for the oldest people I can find. Growing up in Brooklyn, we hang out with the oldest people we can find. And they would tell us certain things, you see. So again, that foundation was what helped me to be strong and to survive. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but your first composition was actually a piece called Zulu. And then I think your second composition <laughs> was a piece called Under Blunder, which you wrote describing people around you as you got trapped in a subway under the East River. Um, <laughs> but you went on from there to, to, to deal with the, the continent of Africa in so many ways in, in your composition. And one of your crowning achievements was in 1960 when you wrote and recorded Uhuru Africa, uh, Freedom Africa. Uh, talk about that whole experience and how that came together? Well, again, uh, my foundation and my dad and my mom instilled upon me, you are responsible to bring your people together in any way that you can. You know, I had a talent of music. And I met uh, the great Melba Liston. Melba was playing trombone with the great Dizzy Gillespie Orchestra. I never saw a woman play a trombone before. And she did an incredible arrangement 
called My Reverie, and I have to emphasize Dizzy. Dizzy was very important in my life because in the 1940s, Dizzy brought to New York the great African Cuban percussionist Chano Pozo. And when I heard that Cuban African drum with Dizzy's orchestra, which had Lee Morgan on trumpet, Charlie Pacip on drums, it, it playing this music that I had never heard before, mm -hmm. but with this drum, and he has Melba Liston playing the trombone. So when I heard her perform, and she came down the stage with some kind of electricity. I went to her and introduced myself to her. And I said, I love your arrangement, and uh, maybe you could do some writing for me in the future. She was living in California at that time. She eventually moved to New York. And she lived in Harlem, not, not far from Mary Lou Williams. So because of her, I met Mary Lou. We collaborated in 1958 my first recording for United Artists, which was seven waltzes for children. Somehow, the three, four rhythm, the six, eight rhythm is very natural to me, you see? And somehow, children, for me, that three, four rhythm is great. So I wrote seven pieces, one for a little girl, one for a little boy, one for children climbing a hill, one for children singing the blues, one for children ice skating, one for children, a child being born, because when a child is born, as soon as the child arrived, it's music. As soon as we arrived, it's music. The rhythm of the hands, the voice of the sound. So I went to Melba, and she, I sat next to her. I played the songs on the piano. She had a tape recorder. She taped each song as I played on the piano. And then I would tell her, OK, in this song, I would like to have Johnny Griffin play on Nice Ice, which is a song I wrote about children ice skating. I would like to have Ray Copeland play on Little Niles, which is a song written for my son. John Mianos like to have him play bass on Bass Blues. So that's how we started. But I found out that we had the same love for our people. And we had the same pain to see how our people was projected. So I wanted to do a work of music that would show that we are a global people and cut down all those barriers. In other words, we are African first. After that, we become whatever, religion or name or whatever. But first, we're an African people. So what happened, I wrote four movements. The first was called Freedom Now, because in 1960, when we did Uhu Africa, 17 African countries got their independence in 1960. And so, I went to, in these four movies, I'm sorry, the first one was called Freedom First because the, everybody, not everybody, but the system was saying, you know, Africa's not ready for independence, you know. I said, no, Africa got to have the independence and we make our own mistakes, not somebody making mistakes for us. The second movement was called African Lady. African Lady was dedicated to my mother, my sister, all the women, the cousins, the daughters, all those women who tend to be in the background, you know, and never get the credit. And most of us cannot function without the support of our women. So that was African Lady. The third movement was called Bantu. Bantu was about the people, the southern part of Africa. And the last movement was called Kucheza Blues. And Kucheza Blues was simply a way of saying, when African people, when we get our cultural and spiritual freedom, which means know who we are and mean how much we've contributed to the world, we're going to have one big party all over the planet with all the rhythms, you know. So that was the foundation of the suite. I talked to Melba about that. At that time, I was very happy to have met and known Langston Hughes. I went to Langston. I said, Langston, would you kindly write a freedom poem for me? He said he'd be very happy to. I said, Langston, would you write words for African lady? He said he would do that. Then uh, we assembled the orchestra, which was incredible. The trumpet section was Freddie Hubbard, Clark Terry, Richard Williams, Benny Bailey. The trombone section was Quentin Jackson, Jimmy Cleveland, and Slide Hampton. We had Julius Watkins on French horn. The rhythm section was Youssef Latif, Cecil Payne, Sahib Shahab, Gigi Grice, Jerome Richardson. 
and we had Les Pan on flute, and we also had Kenny Burrell on guitar, and also Les Pan played flute and guitar. The rhythm section, we had Max Roach playing marimba. We had Ron Carter on bass, George DeVille on bass. We had Charlie Pacip on drums. We had G.T. Hogan on drums. We had Baba Tuni Olatunji on drums. And we had Candido and Amanda Peraza from Cuba. And we put these people together. And what was missing was the African language. Because as a boy, I was always very sensitive to those tiles in movies. And every time you see African people, we were servants. Tarzan, he was the strongest man in Africa. When I was a kid, I used to be very upset about that. And then you hear the Africans in the movies speaking this nonsense, you know, one of this and one of that, you know. So in the whole Africa, I had to have an African language so people could hear the beauty of African language because language was created in Africa in the first place. The first written language took place in Africa, but most of the people don't know that. So I went to the United Nations and I talked to a lot of diplomats. 1960 was an interesting period because being in New York and with the United Nations being close by, I had an opportunity to meet many different African delegates, first secretaries of different countries, Ghana, Nigeria, etc., etc. So the general consensus, they said, well, look, use Kiswahili. Now, Africa has over 900 dialects and languages, but we chose Kiswahili. I got two singers, Brock Peters and Martha Flowers, to sing African Lady. And I went to a man named Tutameke Sanga. Tutameke was from Tanzania. He was a real revolutionary brother. When I met him in 1960, he was saying, Africa will never be free until they had the atomic bomb. <laughs> That's where he was. And this brother was incredible because in the wintertime, he never wore a coat. I never understood that brother. He only wore a suit. But he ended up being our teacher of Kiswahili. He translated Langston Hughes' poem into Kiswahili. So on the recording, you hear it in English, then you hear it in Kiswahili. And when you hear the Kiswahili, you hear the beauty of African language, which was my point. Well, it was such a spiritual movement that, believe it or not, we had to record 9 o'clock in the morning because I think Candido, he had to go somewhere. And we had to have that Caribbean influence, especially Cuba, you know. So we had to make the record date uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, two days in a row. Everybody was on time. That never happens, you know. Think but about how unusual show, that is. <laughs> yeah, it was that period of, of African liberation, African dignity. Max Roach did Free Him Now, Sweet, Sonny Rollins. I was about my sub, John Coltrane. We all express ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. to welcome the new African nations. Yeah. Well, you know, it was interesting in, 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 in uh, working on the book, I had an opportunity to interview uh, some of the musicians who participated in that session, like Ron Carter and uh, Youssef Latif and Clark Terry and a couple of others. I left out Bud Johnson, I'm yeah, sorry. Bud Johnson, right, right, sorry. right. And, and, and uh, to a man, they said that when they arrived at the studio, they weren't sure how this disparate group of musicians was going to come together. <laughs> but after the recording of the invocation, which was Langston Hughes' freedom poem, translated into Kiswahili, they immediately locked into the whole notion of the recording and that's what really set things off. Yeah, because they had no idea what we were doing, you know. And at that time, Africa wasn't exactly, shall we say, popular. Uh, you know, some people didn't want to identify with Africa. So, the, so we got in the city, they had no idea what it was going to be like. And I have to point out several things. Melba Liston is a genius. She's one of our greatest arrangers. But unfortunately, she was a very quiet person and she was a black woman. And those are two reasons not to be heard. But Melba Liston wrote arrangements for Count Basie, Duke Ellington. She wrote arrangements for Motown. Like every day, she was writing arrangements for Motown. I took her to Jamaica she stayed five years. She wrote for Bob Marley and people like that. So she was the total arranger, Melba Liston, you know. 
And before the recording, at my apartment in New York, Melba Listen had the copiers. She had some of the musicians copying parts on the, on the ceiling, on the wall, whatnot. And the poor copiers, the guy was so tired, his legs were swollen, that we carried him down the stairs in a chair, put him in a taxi, took him to the studio, still copying parts. <laughs> but the beauty of this recording was, Melba Liston conducted the orchestra. And to see this beautiful African woman conducting this tremendous orchestra and putting these arrangements, is one of the high points of my life. And I have to point out, last year, we had a, uh, we had a celebration of Uhuru Africa. Last year was 50 years ago we did this work, and also 17 African countries. And they had African Day in New York, which I went to play, and we all kind of celebrated. And we had a concert at uh, Tribeca, Manhattan Community College, in November. And I assembled an orchestra. Only Charlie Pacific and Candido were there from the original orchestra. But we put together musicians from Ghana, from Honduras, from Cuba, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Mississippi, from San Francisco, from New York, we put them together. And the purpose of the work is to show we are one African people, and that's it. All right, now you, you, you've talked about how you had this wonderful uh, African indoctrination. And, and, and I should say that you know during the course of the book, I used the term Afrocentric, but I was cautioned that the term from Randy's perspective, should correctly be African-centric. You had this, this, this wonderful indoctrination at home, and you have, by 1960, written this beautiful suite of music in tribute to these African nations achieving uh, independence from colonization. But you still hadn't made it to the continent yet. What took you so long, and how, what was the circumstance behind you finally making it to Africa? Well, I found out nothing happened before its time in the first place because the Creator makes all the plans. And in my life, you know, you see in a book, I mean, things happen I could not possibly explain, you know. So I truly believe that my life has been laid out, you know. Certain people are left in my life, some put me down, some pick me up. But I had to have that experience to stay focused. And having such strong parents, I had to stay focused. My mom and dad died years ago, but they sit right here with me, you know, because they have that pride and that dignity as a people. And that it's, it's, it kind of stayed with me, will it, you know? Mm -hmm. So t talk about the circumstance behind you uh, uh, when you made your first journey to Africa. Well, there was an organization called the American Society of African Culture, called AMSAC. They were based in New York City, and they would bring painters, sculptors, musicians, ethnomusicologists to New York, and they would have panels and discussions, and they record this. They were based in Africa, in Lagos, in, in, in Nigeria. And finally, in 1961, they wanted to have the first African-American African summit. And they chose 29 of us to go to Nigeria, to spend 10 days in Nigeria. So of the 29 people was Langston Hughes. Lionel Hampton had eight members of his band. I took with me the great saxophonist Booker Irvin and a drummer from Brooklyn named Scobie Stroman. Nina Simone came with Ahmed Abdul Malik on bass and guitar. We had uh, Hale Woodruff. We had Natalie Hinderis. We had uh, Jeffrey Holder from Trinidad. We had Brock Peters. We had Al Mims and Leon James, two dancers from the Savoy Ballroom, who knew of the history of jazz dance, going back to the cakewalk all the way up because we had worked together doing the history of jazz. We start off with Africa and we end with Africa, which means Africa is the past, Africa is the present, Africa is the future, you see. And they all hook together. So, so with, a, with a, a, such a, a, a wonderful group 
of artists. What were the activities like when you, when you got to Nigeria? Okay, we arrived uh, 11 o'clock at night. And it's funny, it seemed like uh, we were on an air Italian flight. You had to fly from New York to Rome, then from Rome you go to Lagos, you know. But it seemed like when the pilot said we're over Africa, and I can't tell you the excitement. That first trip to Africa, uh, those of us that made the journey, you can understand what I mean, you know. You're coming back to your ancestral home, your place of origin, your geographical, historical, cultural foundation is Mother Africa. And the plane arrived at 11 o'clock at night, and before the plane arrived, it seemed to me that the, the, that the motor of the plane, this is before the jets, by the way, it seemed like the motor of the plane was going into an African rhythm. <laughs> and I was hearing the rhythm of the plane and some melodies started to come into my head. When the plane landed, 11 o'clock at night, the door opened up. And those of you who have been to West Africa, there's a certain smell in the air when the door opens of the plane. And we came out, and we were the three tallest, Jeffrey Holder, myself, and Brock Peters. Somehow we were the first ones to come out of the plane. I don't know why. The Nigerians had 50 drums. And these drums started playing, and it was incredible. And some people were crying. Some of us kissed the earth. We finally had a chance to come home. Because many of us have never had an opportunity to go to Africa. Can live a whole lifetime on the planet and never have an opportunity to go back to our place of origin. And it was so spiritual. Now, what happened during the day? Likes and Hughes is very, very popular in Nigeria. I have to point that out to you. They would have discussions during the day. They have seminars about different things. And they have concerts at night. And at night, they might have some African traditional musicians on one side of the stage. They have the two dancers from the Savoy Ballroom on this side of the stage. And then we start looking, you know. Now, Baba Olutunji came back with us to Nigeria. He came to Nigeria, took me, took me to his village and whatnot. So we had this collection of everybody listening and watching each other. Now, in Nigeria, I saw the same faces I see here. That's weird. That's weird. To the point, it's kind of scary, because sometimes I want to talk to somebody, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it simply meant that we, we never left. That's the big secret. The biggest secret of all, we never left Africa. That's right. And I know that to be true because one thing I learned from Duke Ellington, mm. one thing I learned, watch black people. Mm. You want inspiration in your music? Watch the way we walk, mm. the way we talk, the way we argue, the way we guess you, the way we cook our food, the way we dance. You watch us and we still have Mother Africa. Mm, that's right. It's pure Africa, pure. So. <laughs> Anyhow, after all the concerts and the seminars, then I go hang out. And there was a club in Lagos called Cabin Bamboo. It was owned by a man named Bobby Benson. Bobby was a great drummer and an incredible guitarist. I'd never heard nobody play guitar like this guy. Some other kind of stuff, you know. So we had this club called the Cabin Bamboo, and in this club, they would have high life music during the week. So now when I heard this high life, it was like hearing Calypso coming back to Africa, you know, and all the women be dancing, especially the big fat sisters, you know, they be dancing. Wow. <laughs> you know, and, and, and the club, the dance is like in the center and the tables all around the club. But on weekends, they would bring to traditional music. Now one experience I'll never forget, they brought some people from the northern part of Nigeria, mm. and they came with this huge balafone, enormous balafone, right from here to there. The grandfather, the father, the children, all of them played this instrument, and they started playing. And then they had about six women, and these women had bolts of cloth, just cloth, you know, and they were playing a rhythm on this cloth. You know. So I'm sitting at the table, and I'm hearing this music, and something told me to get up and go sit with them. Now, I don't know why I did that. 
I got the table and I went and sat in the middle of these people. Well, about three minutes later, I felt myself leaving the planet. <laughs> and I, I, I cut out right away. <laughs> you know, and that was my ex first experience with the tradition of music of Africa, which is so powerful, so spiritual, because it captures the constant itself. At the same time, Bobby would have the young West African musicians would come and want to play our music, you see. So that's where I met Fela. I met Fela in 1963 when he was playing trumpet before he played saxophone. And we played, played together in 1963. So that was my opening for Africa, Nigeria. When I went to Nigeria, I was at home. Like I had never left. Well, now you, you mentioned Fela. You got to tell us a story about uh, playing with Fela at the shrine. <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. Okay, this is 1988, right? And they gave me an award in Nigeria in 1988. So I went to Fella's Shrine, and Fella had this incredible club, all about a thousand people. I mean, incredible. And he had his band, and they got that Afro beat. Yeah. So then Fella called me, and I got up on the stage, and I started to play a little bit with the band, you know, we just played, you know. So then after that, after the music stopped, he grabbed my hand. Mm. He said, all the young people, brothers and sisters, I want you to meet Randy Weston, da 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 ba 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 And this jive military government and these songs also. <laughs> and I'm trying to get my hand back. <laughs> <laughs> He was the most fearless musician I ever met. And when we left one week later, the soldiers came down and burned down his club. Yeah. And his mother threw her out, out, out one flight story out the house, you know. So that was my experience with Nigeria. <laughs> but Fela, he was amazing. Amazing guy. Now that was, that was Nigeria. And then you, your, your second trip, you went back with Elton Fax, mm, yes, uh, but you still hadn't gone to play, uh, to play as a band leader to play your music. Uh, talk about your experience, your first experience touring in Africa. Well, in 1967, I was chosen to do a State Department tour because they knew our culture is very important for for Africa. And I put together a, a band of Clifford Jordan on tenor saxophone, Ray Copeland on trumpet, Ed Blackwell on drums, Chief Bay, African traditional drums, Bill Wood on bass, and I brought my son along, who was 15 years old, as a dean. And we toured 14 countries in Africa, West Africa and North Africa, and also Beirut, Lebanon. Now what we did, we did a program we called the History of Jazz, which means we started with Africa, then we go to the Caribbean, then we go to the black church, then we do the 20s, the 30s, if Chief Bay would sing Ma Rainey of the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, the so-called bebop, and then we end with the African cookbook. So the purpose of the program is that Africa is the past, the present, and the future. So I had an opportunity to play my music for the first time in Africa, and thank goodness we were successful. But I can't point out the, the importance of Chief Bay and Ed Blackwell. Ed Blackwell be from New Orleans, and the New Orleans drummers, they play in such a way that you dance when they play, you know. They got a certain way of playing the drums, you know. So the African people could identify. And wherever I played, whether it was Gabon or Mali or Cameroon or Niger, we went to Ghana, we went to uh, Sierra Leone, went to Liberia, Egypt, wherever we went. I always say to the African audience, I said, listen, this is your music. You may not recognize it because it left Africa and it came in contact with other cultures. But this is your music. We bring it back to you. you know? And I always emphasize that for African audiences, which is true. So it, it was marvelous. I was so thrilled because uh, they love my music. And like I say, if you're going to write music about Africa, you got to go to the continent to prove, you know, to the African people like your music. But we had, we had a great success. Yeah. All right, now you had this tour, and you've talked about 
playing in Nigeria and Ghana and Sierra Leone, Morocco, when they think of those countries, they tend to think more of the Middle East. Some folks don't consider, don't, don't think of those countries as being African. How is it that you wound up living for seven years in Morocco? Well, the Creator makes all the plans. <laughs> I have to emphasize that. I see that very seriously. As it turned out, the last concert of the tour was in Rabat in Morocco. And when you do those State Department tours, when the, when the, when the, when, when the tour is over, you have to make a report, what you liked about the tour, what you mm. did like the tour. For example, we were in Burkina Faso. Mm. At, time, at that time, it was called Hot Volta. When we were there, we had a meeting with all the State Department officers and the engineers and whatnot, you know. So one of the guys, he said, he said, you know, tonight, I don't think you all should take any bass solo because these people don't, they don't understand the bass, you know. Mm. So I jumped up, I said, you're talking about, these are my people. That's right. And the guy turned red. He couldn't understand <laughs> it. I said, these are my people, you know. And don't tell me about what to play, you know. Another time in Egypt, just before the Seven War took place, mm, right. we played the African cookbook, which we always end up with the African cookbook. And the whole area was like this. And we played the African cookbook. The Egyptian audience took the, song, took the rhythm and the song away from us mm, with hand claps. Mm. And Chief Bey, he was taking a solo. They wouldn't let Chief stop. He was getting tired. And they kept saying, hey, this is our rhythm. We're going to give it back to you, right? And so that's what happened. It was so powerful when we came back to Cairo, the American ambassador sent a note asking us not to play the African cookbook. So I said, no, the band said, I'm the chief. <laughs> he has his job, I have my job. See? But that was, the, that was the impact of the music. You know? And so you wound up in Morocco, how'd that happen? That's what you did ask me, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I, I, went, around, I went around the corner, didn't I? <laughs> Poor Willie. Improvisation, improvisation. Every time he says something, I go somewhere else. <laughs> Forgive me. Back to Morocco. That's why it took nine years to come this book. <laughs> <coughs> Getting back to the report, I stayed in Rabat to work on the report so I could get the rest of the money to pay everybody, right? So this was the time when the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan's show. And when I saw the English coming back with our music mm. and big, big stars, I know we were in trouble. Mm. Uh, we didn't have the cultural leadership that we needed, and we were in trouble. So that's when I said, I want to live in Africa. I want to be close to the traditional people. That's what I want to be. But what happened, it would, ideally it would have been Nigeria. But Nigeria was going through the Biafra War at that particular time. So. I didn't know what country, and you know, when you do those State Department tours, it's difficult to pick a country because when you do a tour, you get red carpet treatment. You meet ambassadors and presidents and whatnot. So to get to the people, you got to really hang out at night or whatever. So I went back to New York. One month later, I got letters from the Morocco, from the American Embassy, from Moroccan people, said the Moroccan people are crazy about your music. They want you to come back. I went back and I stayed between six and seven years in Morocco. Now, while I was there, again, going back to West Africa, Fela had his own club. Sony Adie had his own club in Nigeria, okay? I wanted to have my own club. I wanted to have a place which would be a cultural base, not only for our music, but in New York, in the States, that heroin, that alcohol, was killing our people. Right. So I wanted to have a base in Africa that the musicians could come and spend two or three weeks and get their bodies back in shape, get their spirit back, be with the elders, go back to the place of origin. So anyhow, as it turned out, I brought my two children with me, and I found out that the best American school for them was in Tangier. So I moved to Tangier, and while I was in Tangier, I met a man he was, he was in Morocco, 
And he said to me, hey, man, he said, I got your Uhu Africa mm. album. And I said, no. He said, yeah. Took me to his home, make a long story short. He helped me to start my own club with my son. And the club was called African Rhythms. Now, in this club, we had everything from a Chicago blues band to singers from the Congo singing Lingali. Because the whole purpose of the club was, it's not a jazz club. This is an African club. It includes all our music. So one wonderful day, a very beautiful young lady came in Tangier. Mama. And she, came, and, and, and she was an incredible dancer. And she's in the room. And she's right here. <laughs> Deep here. <laughs> so what happened to have a trio, we didn't have all the musicians that we have here. So my original trio was my son of percussion, Dietrich dance, and myself at the piano. And that's when we had, had the club. And I had the club open for three years, and finally in 1972, we had the only, in the history of Morocco, we had the only African-American, African Moorish festival in Morocco. I brought over 40 musicians, thanks to Max Roach, who was in New York, and also Mary Jo Johnson. So I brought over Max Roach's group, Mandrill, mm. Pucho and his Latin Soul Brothers, Odetta, Amin Abdul Malik and Oud, Dexter Gordon, and Kenny Drew. And we had a bull ring, and we organized the bull ring to have a three day festival in Africa. Now, this never happened before. Now, getting back to Morocco, why in Morocco? I didn't speak no Arabic, no Berber languages. No French, no Spanish. Very little English is spoken in Morocco. But I found out why the Creator sent me there. Because in North Africa, you have the black people who were taken as slaves and soldiers from the ancient African empires. That's right. They're all in North Africa, but they're not recognized. Okay? So I heard the music of the Ganawa people. These are the people who come from the region of Segu, uh, Bambara, you know, that part of Mali, from the Mali Kingdom, and they play some power. So I met these people. I said, okay, that's why I'm in Morocco. So I spent time with these people. We've been together now over 40 years. And I learned something about the power of African tradition of music. I found out that's where we come from. I found out all our music comes from Africa. Because African music is as old as Africa itself. That's right. Music was created in Africa. Our ancient ancestors knew that the universe is the original mm. place of music. Yeah. The Mother Nature is the original orchestra. That each planet has got its own sound. Each planet has got its own rhythm. So our ancient ancestors, they captured the scale from the universe. And music was created as a healing spiritual force. Music is the divine art. Mm. You can't see music, you can't touch music, but music touches you. Mm. Music is the voice of God. Mm. And music is how we survive slavery in this country. Music is how we survive racism in this country. Because if we didn't have the music, we would not have moved. But it was the Louis Jordans and the Billy Holidays yeah, and yeah, Duke yeah, Ellison yeah. and Count Basies and John Lee Hookers mm. and Robert Johnson. All these people created the music that made us laugh in a time we shouldn't be laughing. Mm -hmm. Because they used to say to us, why you black people be laughing all the time, all the pain that you're going through? I said, because we got the music. <laughs> we go to black church on Sunday, the right. sisters go there with the incredible hats. Say it, say it, doctor. I used to love watching sisters with them hats on Sunday in church, you know. But they go in that church, it's an African ceremony in the black church. And when they hear that music, and black people come together, and those vibrations come together, they're charged to go out there and deal with that man for the rest of the week, my, my. who wouldn't give them any decent work and whatnot. So it, it, it's something that's amazing. So that's why I ended up in Morocco. We never had another festival. I was supposed to get paid for my work. They didn't pay me. I had to close my club. I had to leave Morocco. It was a financial disaster, but a cultural success. Because what I learned 
from these people, you couldn't buy with millions of dollars. I learned African spirituality. I learned what it was in Africa to be a master musician. Here in the West, you can be the worst bum in the world and play well and you're great. Not in strict society. You gotta be respected by the community. You have to be a historian. You have to be a healer. You have to be able to play games with music. You know, and you have to do things in music that we've forgotten about. But at the same time, for me, we're just an extension of the great African empires. And it's the creator's wish that we were taken from Africa because of all the things that happened to us. Look at the beauty that we produce in Brazil, in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Puerto Rico, in the United States. Every go black people. So wherever I go in the world and I see black people, I know I'm going to find a very powerful spiritual music. Mm, that's right. That's right. I'm not talking about religion. Mm. I'm talking about spirituality. That's right. And John, the great John Henry Clark, who made such a major impact upon me, he said it very simply. He said, Africa is our center of gravity. Ah, he said, Africa is our mother and father, is our cultural and spiritual mother and father, no matter where we are on the planet, you see. So coming back from Africa, now when I look at our people, I see African people. Ah, I watch the way you all walk, the way you talk, the way you argue, the way you fuss, the way you dare. We never left a continent. And that's the big secret. So with our music, I call my music African rhythm because for me, jazz is African music in America, blues is African music that's in Jamaica, right. right. bossa nova is African music in Brazil, Cuban music is African music in Cuba. And that's it, man. <laughs> hey, who are you? <laughs> oh, I forgot the most important part about our music. Humor. Oh, yeah, that's right. Humor. Monk could go to the piano and hit a chord and make you laugh. You don't know why you laugh. Mm -hmm. Louis Armstrong hit a note and make you laugh. Because humor is a very important part of healing. You know. So you know us, sometimes we have a bad time with the blues. Oh, I heard so good, I heard so good. I got to sing the blues, you know. Yeah. Now what was I supposed to do now? Tell us, tell us your bird story. <laughs> oh, Charlie Parker story. Yes, sir. That Max Roach, I could kill him. Wow. I, was in, I was in the restaurant business with my dad, and Max's house was two, two blocks away. And when I wasn't working, I'd go to Max's house, and I'd just sit in the corner. There's Charlie Parker. There's Dizzy, there's Miles, there's George Russell. They working on Cabana B, Cabana Bob, and I sit there and watch and listen, watch and listen. And I was not a professional musician. I just come out the army, I was working at my father's restaurant and just make local gigs, like weddings. I even played burlesque, solo piano. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead you know, where's the next gig? You know, no matter what it is, right? And you make your three dollars and be very happy. And sometimes they run out with the money. You get to get paid, where's my $3? The guy's gone, you know. <laughs> so Charlie Parker? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting there one day, and Charlie Parker's there, and Max said, hey Randy, say play some of your songs for Charlie Parker. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because Charlie Parker, I can't explain Charlie. He, he had something angelic mm. about him. Mm. His face, his genius was something, you know. And with Johnny Parker, all of us were, all the other musicians were great, but he was something special. And I was like this, you know. I said, come on, man, play something for Charlie Parker. I forgot what I played. One month later, we are going to a club called the Royal Roos, which is on Broadway to hear the great Tad Dameron, mm. Fasten Navarro, and Charlie Wells, Curly Russell on bass. So the club, you go down the stairs like this, and there's a bar, and a lot of people are at the bar. And who's at the bar but Charlie Parker? Mm. Now, Charlie Parker was so spiritual, you never saw Charlie Parker without his saxophone. I think he slept with the saxophone. <laughs> if you go to the market, the saxophone, he never had that saxophone in his hand. And sometimes the saxophone would be with rubber bands and chewing gum, all that type of stuff. So anyhow, he does like this. We're coming down the stairs. Myself, a young drummer, 
named Maurice Brown, who studied with Max Roach, because Max also had his own studio to teach young musicians in Brooklyn. So Charlie, just like this, you know. So I said, who's he talking to? He said, man, he's talking to you. I said, Charlie Parker, remember me? He said, yeah, yeah, come on. So we go downstairs. He says, what are y'all doing? I said, we're going to come in here, Tad and Festival. He said, come with me. So he takes us upstairs. He calls a taxi. He takes us to 52nd Street. Now, 52nd Street, each club next to each club, here's Coleman Hawkins, here's Errol Garner, here's Louis Armstrong, here's, I mean, the music, unbelievable. All the heavyweights, right? So we were Charlie Parker in the taxi, you know, what he's going to do with us. So we walk into this club, and there's some musicians playing on the stage. Now, one thing that you don't do, you don't interrupt a musician when he's playing his instrument. That's a way to die. But Charlie Parker walked up on the stage while the guys were playing. He told the piano player, get up. In the middle of a song. And the guy said, He told the drummer to get up. Well. <laughs> he told the drummer to sit the drum, told me to sit at the piano. Mm. He took out his saxophone. He played 45 minutes with us. Mm. Packed up his horn and left and didn't say a word. <laughs> and we were in heaven for one year. <laughs> <laughs> we played with Charlie Parker. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> Don't all raise your hands at once. Yes, sir. How did y'all? How did y'all get off the stage? He left. He left y'all on the stage. How did y'all get off the stage? Where? And when Charlie Parker left off the stage, how did you and the drummer get off the stage? Well, we had to get off because that was that was the, 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 the musician. That off. was their gig. That's my own question. That was their gig, you know. And we thought he was going to say something. Right. He didn't say nothing. Just left us, but we were in heaven, man. Yes, sir, in the yellow jacket. Uh, yes, um, to everyone up there and to this August fighting, to the brother uh, Randy Weston. Uh, Arnold Ford, mm. the musical general for the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community League, um, many of his songs, but perhaps um, Ethiopia, thy land of thy father's the land where the gods love to be. Uh, even though he left here in 1929, were you in any contact with any of his people who played music and the impact of music within the African International of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community League? What, what, how did that impact you? Because you talked about your Panamanian dad and your Virginian mother um, and his, I kind of like a, his kind of solo, solo Garveyism. How did the music impact you from the people who were Garveyites, though they were solo or though they were in the Universal Negro Improvement Association African community? Well, you know, I, I, I have, all, I, as a boy, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, the piano teacher gave up on me. I was very slow. My father was very slow. And I always was intimidated because my father would say, how much is 109 times 6. Mm. Don't pick up no pencil in your head. Right? So I was always very like this. But what I found out, it's like a period of spiritual mm. all the music I've heard whether it was a Basie or a Duke or Mahalia Jackson or Calypso mm. or blues, it's a period absorbing. When I went to Africa, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't write no music because they don't write no music. Their music is in tune with Mother Nature. Mm. They learn their music by listening to the sounds of Africa. Mm. So it's like a, a feeling of a good example. I heard Monk with Coleman Hawkins. Mm. Coleman Hawkins was my idol. Mm. When he did Body and Soul in 1939, it was one of the greatest 
examples of music I've ever heard in my life. Because Coleman Hawkins, it was a big hit. Housewives were buying Body and Soul. I bought three copies of Body and Soul. I hid two, and I played one out loud so everybody in the street could hear Body and Soul when I was a kid, right? So Coleman Hawkins was my key. Through him, I heard Hank Jones. Through him, I heard Sir Charles Thompson. I went to hear him one night, and I saw this guy on the piano I had never heard before. But he wasn't playing too many notes. So I'm just listening, I said, well, what's Coleman Hawkins doing with this guy, man? He can't play no piano. I can play more piano than him, right? But I went back to hear this guy. He was Thelonious Monk. Mm. It's because he had a different way of playing the piano. And I said, because I was always interested in sound. Why Duke Ellington for me and Monk are related for me? Because they put for me the magic of Africa into the piano. It's almost like you have a European instrument, but once we touch it, it becomes an African instrument because the spiritual of Africa goes into that instrument, right? So when I heard Monk, I said, wow. Because before that, Amin Abdul Malik played the bass in the oud. He take me to downtown section of Brooklyn to listen to North African music. Listen to the oud, listen to Kanun. And he could play between the notes on the bass. But I couldn't find that on the piano. I wanted to find something on the piano. I couldn't find it. Monk was doing it. So after I heard Ruby My Dear the first time with Coleman Hawkins playing at Monk on the piano, I introduced myself to Thelonious. I said, excuse me, sir. I said, man, I love your music. Can I come by and visit you? He said, yeah, come, you come by my house. I went to Monk's house. Nellie was there, his future wife. She let me in. I walk into the room. And Monk is sitting in a chair in a corner, and the radio is playing very softly. And he got Billy Holiday's picture in the mm -hmm. middle of the ceiling, and a red light, and a piano. So I walked in. Uh, Mr. Monk, uh, how do you do this? Uh, uh, Mr. Monk, uh, what about this? Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Monk, about that? No response. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So about one hour of questions, I shut up. Because <laughs> I wasn't getting nothing back, you know. At the same time, I couldn't leave the room. And I sat there, I don't know how many hours, I just sat there. The only thing Monk said to me was, listen to all kinds of music. So somehow I got the courage to get up. I said, Mr. Monk, thank you very much for inviting me, you know. And he said, oh, you come and see me again. <laughs> <laughs> so I came out of the house, I said, man, what happened? You know, this guy didn't answer nothing I asked him, you know? I went back, and Monk played the piano two or three hours for me. Which meant, in Sufism, the communication, not the spoken word, he was checking me out through vibrations. And after that, by spending three years with Monk, three years, he never gave me a piano lesson, mm. but every day I got a piano lesson. Mm. Watching him, you know, Same. for me when he played the piano, it's like an African belly. Mm. You see him play, it's like that. People laugh, pure Africa. And when I heard him play the piano, I heard Egypt 5,000 mm. years ago, Same. Same. right away. Because this was not no bebop, this was music to me to touch the universe. So for Monk, by being with him, by absorbing, somehow, I got the sound that I wanted. Mm. But it's a sound, it's a sound of magic. It's African magic. You can't just, you, you don't learn that in, in a textbook. It's, it's like, right. it's like your personality, but at the same time you're absorbing, your ancestors mm. come with that personality. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it comes out saying, I am an African. This is so and so, and I've approached my life this way. And I'm proud of my people. I'm proud of who I am, you see. So that, that, that whole magical process, you know. Mm. But from that point on, all of a sudden, I had my own sound. Mm. Now, I don't know how you get your sound. It, it's something that you can't explain. Mm. 
But I know Monk had a lot to do with it. Yes, sir, and I had baseball cap. Okay, greetings, uh, Baba uh, Brandon. I have a question and a comment. Uh, the question is, the uh, I, read you, I was reading your book last night, um, almost finished. The Afro-American Musician Society, what is the Afro-American Musician Society? You, know, you said you did a fundraiser for them. And also, a little humor, I was reading something when you was in Tunisia, and, <laughs> and they had it, according to the book, in the paper they had, Randy Weston and Uncle Tom from the United States playing in Tunisia or something like that. What was that all about? Not Randy, it said Randy Weston. Jazz. Uncle Tom of jazz. They, you know, they don't know. <laughs> As is, that was basically because, you know, they, they they heard that term, but they didn't understand that that was a derogatory term. Yeah. yeah. So, well, so they just misused the term. Yeah. They, 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 they thought that was some kind of honorific. Yeah. Uh, so they put that in the paper. That was all that was about. Yeah. No, but he wanted to know about the Afro American musicians. Uh, so. Well, what happened, uh, as I said to you before, I, I was a big. I was a big fan. I loved his music with a passion before I ever played the music. Mm. And I was very upset with the conditions mm. that people like Monk and Dexter Gordon had to play in. Play in these funky clubs, dirty clubs, no dressing room. Wow. A place like the Fire Spot, they had one little funky stand where they would cook hamburgers. The door that opened up the toilet, you could almost smell the odor mm. of the toilet and whatnot. And when you see people like Dexter, like Max, these giants have to, when they get through playing, have to stand up in a room where there's mm. soda crates. Mm. Plus musicians were getting very little pay. Now I have to point out, I was very influenced by James Reese Europe. Mm. And that happened because of Lucky Roberts. Lucky Roberts was the great pianist, great composer. He had a club in Harlem called Lucky's. Mm. And Lucky was one of the teachers of George Gershwin. A lot of people don't know that. He was a master. Now Lucky told me, when I was about 17 years old, he said, Randy, he said, we, we, we old timers, we let you young people down. Mm. I said, why did you say that, Lucky? I said, because we didn't, we didn't leave you anything. Mm. He said, when James Reese of Europe died, we died. Mm. Then I started doing research on James Reese of Europe. 1913, Carnegie Hall, mm. with 150 black and Puerto Rican musicians, with 10 pianos in 1913. The first ones to bring this music to France in the army, decorated by the French army, the 369th. But what inspired me about James Reese Europe, he arranged the first black union of mm. black people, because the unions were racist. The musician union was all white, was not black. So what James V. Europe, with his genius as a musician, organizer, in the early part of the 20th century, he organized seven different orchestras playing all kinds of music. They could read anything, they can play any kind of music, society music, seven orchestras, and they established what they called the Cliff Club. Mm -hmm. Cliff Club was in the midtown of New York City, and that was a place where black artists could come. Mm. Because we weren't allowed in hotels, we weren't allowed in the restaurants, we had to have our own mm. thing. So Jay's view inspired me. So because of the conditions I saw, I wanted to organize an organization of black musicians. Mm. I got together with John Handy, Melba Liston, Sadiq Hakim, uh, Lewis Brown, uh, Ray Bryant, absolutely, Ray Bryant. <coughs> we got together 
And we've started organizing at Langston Hughes' secretary place called the Marketplace in Harlem. And we all got together and we started writing letters to musicians from Maine to Florida. We call our organization the Afro-American Musician Society and we wanted to have a conference of musicians to see how we could form our own organization of musicians so we wouldn't be taken advantage of like we were. Low pay, terrible conditions, no respect. Okay, so we had a, a three-day conference at St. Philip's Church in Harlem. Reverend Weston, Reverend Weston no relation, his church. And we had, as our speakers, we had, um, we had John Henry Clark for history, A. Philip Randolph for labor. So we had a three-day conference and we tried to organize African-American musicians. Well, we had several problems. At that time, unfortunately, some of the musicians didn't want to be identified with Africa. They wanted to be American Negroes. And when you say Afro-American society, that was like a contradiction. Uh, the, the people who, who took care of jazz, they were against us and whatnot. Mm. So we only functioned for one year. But what we did was, Ray Bryant, he knew the black vice president of Pepsi-Cola, Harvey Russell. We got together 40 concerts mm. of the history of our music into the elementary schools in New York. That means we would call a school 7 o'clock in the morning. You want a free concert? Mm. So Ray Bryant would go play his concept of the history of jazz. I would do my concert history of jazz. Nadi Kamal was the other one. So that was the story of the African American, African American Musician Society. And we were so influential in that one year that Hoffa, who was the head of the union in Chicago, he sent some union people to come to New York to organize us. But we didn't want to be bothered with that. So that's the story of the society. Yeah. Mitchell had the last word. I want to give thanks. Thank you for me, I want to give thanks to Randy and Fatou, mm, yeah. more importantly, for this particular experience. That's right. And obviously Willard, who, played a, who has played a major part in the shaping of these last nine mm. years. It's a tremendous body of work that had to be done mm. in order to arrive at this point. But as I listened to you last night and today, mm. I come to grips with the question of dignity. Mm. How do we survive without dignity? We cannot survive without dignity. How do, we, how do we become a people that have the capacity to pass on our legacy, mm. our history, our vision of tomorrow, mm. if we don't have the integrity of today? Mm. Of course. That, that, that must represent the truth of what it is we are experiencing, and more importantly, of who we are. Of course. And you spend the whole evening insisting mm. on who we are, juxtaposed against all of us who don't want to be who you're telling us we are. <laughs> and as we walk out of here, we walk out of here as somebody else, rather than the person that you are saying, it takes this long to get that good. Mm. Somebody asked me if Randy Weston could be, you know, why is he an icon? I said, because he's lived 85 years ah, and still that. remain a man of absolute integrity. What he believed in in the beginning is what he is today and what he will be tomorrow, based on his father, mother, mm, right. and those people in Brooklyn that have elevated him. Now, we've lost communities today. We become disparate people. We become disparate people even in Africa. Of course. Yes. As our nations and our leaders move away from each other mm. and forget. Exactly. We no longer teach our children who's, who is, 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 is Sheikh Anta Diop, ah. who is Fano. Our children don't say, know. Say Consequently, how are they going to know who is this Gillespie, mm. who is John Coltrane, exactly. we have forgotten the love supreme. Exactly. We don't live a love supreme. Mm. Yes. And therefore you have demonstrated that in your life. You have come here to us and you didn't go to bus boys and poets. Mm. Uh -huh. I can't tell you how deeply that means, what that means to me, that you came here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
opportunity because you could have easily gone to Bus Boys and Poets to do this and I would not have been there. Oh, by the way, Professor Lynch. You're not Professor Ackerman. Ah, Ackerman, pardon me. Ackerman Lynch, Dr. Lynch, not Dr. Ackerman. He brought Max Roach and myself yes, sir. to the University of Mass. It was here. Yeah. And he gave a birthday party for me. It was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. and, and you were one of my teachers, too, sir, because you have never, you've always been like this. And you inspire me. Thank you. And, 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 and before we get away from here and I get a reputation for ignoring this brother in the front, please ask your question. Please. I, yeah, thank you very much. And um, Dr. <coughs> you said something that, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming. And I want to thank you, Reverend Dr. King, about a, you know, Baptist ministry spiritually, but also book man. And uh, thank you so much for being a reader. You know, uh, one of the reasons I gave you a rare book last night was because I knew you'd read it. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get so, with uh, it. <laughs> one of the things I want to, uh, if you could comment on is the important, importance of reading. Because when you, you made a statement, you said uh, that uh, you believe that God wanted us to, to go through slavery or something. I and mean, if I misstate you, I'm sorry. But that God, in God's plan, slavery was a part of the equation. And the reason I respond to that is, uh, and you can comment if you will, sir, is because uh, in this bookstore, and bookstores like this, they're going out of business because we don't support terrible we can't awesome. books online. Yeah, you know we don't support the great writers and the like. Yeah. Uh, the point I'm making in this bookstore, you have books like *The Destruction of Black Civilization* by Dr. Chancellor Williams, who I fortunately had a, a, a part in getting it out at Third World Press with Hakeem Adebuli and them. But the point I'm making is that you had the Iowa Quay Almas 2000 Seeds, you had Dr. Marimba, on and on, you had a children's book. And when we read, we see that we fought every step of the way against those foreign invaders. And the God that's in us sacrificed ourselves, right? And so I, my, my question is, this concept of this anthropomorphic God or something that might have willed us into slavery, Minister Malcolm would say, you know, that type of God you can take back. My question is, what did you mean by that, and can you comment on the importance of, of reading, please? Well, because it seems that out of adversity, you know, it's like your whole life. The Sufis call it the nafs. That's what they call it, the nafs. Mm. That means that negative force is going all the time. Mm. But you can't have positive without negative. Mm. Okay. And when I see the impact of our people and the world mm. taken away from Africa, mm produce this music. I don't know who made that plan, but it happened. It happened. And what happened, like my wife and I, my wife is from Senegal. I got a blues award in, 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 in Mississippi because the people in Mississippi found out I wrote 40 blues. I didn't know I wrote 40 blues. And we went down to Mississippi and for the first time I saw a cotton field with my own eyes. Okay? I've seen cotton fields in the movies. Mm. And we looked at those cotton fields. And she saw these Sangalese faces mm. that she recognized in Mississippi. And we sat there, had two emotions. Mm. Tears coming out of my eyes. Mm. And those people picking that cotton produced Randy Weston. Mm. Mm. So what a great people we must be, you see. Mm. That's no way. And it's that, it's that thing. You said like you can't have positive without negative. You can't have negative without positive. And the, Afri and the African empires, as you know, they would exist longer than any empires in the history of the world. But as Wayne Chandler says in Ancient Future, we have the motion, what's on top goes down. Gravity. So when you're on top, we go down. We went all the way to the bottom. Everywhere I go, I look for black people. We're on the bottom. But for me, and especially in the past few years, people give me a lot of respect now. They're not giving me more work because now you have to integrate. There aren't many black bands anymore. I'm one of the few. And when you go on the stage, they're all African people. They say, well, that's why I don't call my music. I say, I don't play no jazz. I play African music, man. This is music of my people. The story of my people is in my music, 
you see. But you don't see that much anymore. If I was to get a white musician in my band, I would work more. So the recognition is there, but at the same time, we've got to get back to the black community. And that's what we're thinking and planning. We talk about oh, how we can get back to the black community, how we can get to the black cultural centers in the state, how we can go back to the old blues circuit that I did when I was with Boone Woods Jackson and travel all over the South, you see. Yeah. And that's, so, that's why we're here. That's right. And not politics and pros or bus boys. That's right. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother.